Ube blew up all over the world without much credit to the Philippines. How about calamansi? Hey, this is Filipino, and this is like a specific ingredient that we use. Pitas kala sa kalamansi, ubang kumbuhay. It's almost like a gateway into conversations about heritage. It's something to be proud of. That's the power of deliciousness. Sour is a very Filipino flavor, yet our penchant for all things sour is not some random inclination. One theory suggests that our love for acid flavors might be rooted in history. Author Chef Tatung Sartu says our ancestors may have foraged fruits, many times unripe and sour, and developed a penchant for sourness. It could have also been a way to preserve food. Acidic substances like vinegar and citrus lend antiseptic and antibacterial properties crucial in sterilizing food. Since vinegar is derived from a sugar-containing source in a two-step process, the first being alcohol, which then becomes vinegar, our love for all things sour could have started with our love for alcohol. Like everything where written history is scarce, it's hard to track. However, we are one of the few cultures in the world that I know of with so many different souring agents. Calamansi, or mainly asim, is a quintessential Filipino flavor. Um, it's important in, I think, every dish that we do. There's always that hint of tartness at the end that makes us want to eat more rice. A lot of our dishes are mainly based on it, from sinigang to your marinades from your cooking to sausawan to almost every food that you eat. So I think it's the truly Pinoy flavor. I think salt and asim, yun yun tang the prominent flavors of our cuisine talaga. Indeed, there's something about calamansi and its aroma that makes it such a distinct Filipino flavor. However, it is also used in other Southeast Asian countries, more particularly in Malaysia, in Nyonya or Peranakan food. Also known as calamondin, lemoncito, or panama lime, calamansi is a small hybrid citrus plant native to the Philippines, Borneo, and Sumatra, and the larger area. But it has become more widely recognized as a Philippine fruit since it's predominantly cultivated and exported from the country and is used everywhere from marinades, dips, to dishwashing liquid. But I want to show you something. It started becoming really trendy in Korea in the mid-2010s. They even have a soju flavor with it. And there's a concentrate from Korea. And guess where it's from? Kalamansi is from Vietnam. Why is that? According to the Department of Agriculture, calamansi is one of the most significant food crops grown in the Philippines, ranking fourth in terms of area and production, after pineapple, mango, and banana. Calamansi grown in the Philippines has a thicker rind, a stronger flavor, a longer shelf life, and doesn't lose weight easily because of its superior quality in the area, especially in Oriental Mindoro, Philippines. Sa mga gatong kasi yung pagkain, Sir Bandales ko talaga gumamit ng kalamansi. Yung inasa niya parang, parang ang tawag, parang mas kakaiba, di ba? Parang, parang mas dynamic sa loob ng, ano, Actually, if you're going to eat it, you're going to eat it. We're going to eat it for 1,000 plus sticks only the barbecue. How about the rest? There's lempo, chicken, seafoods. Now, it's probably about 5 to 7 kilos of calamansi because we've got a lot of food, distributed, there's a lot of food. Masaya lang kami kasi yung aming ginawang pagkain para sa mga kababayan natin eh na ano nila na na appreciate nila. 
In a Salsawan culture such as ours, local cooks like Nana and Telma turn to calamansi in bringing balance to flavors and savory dishes. But there are those like Chef Eli Salar who harness the potential of local produce such as calamansi with various culinary techniques to come up with modern desserts. We offer French uh, pastries, which is inspired also by Filipino palate. We also uh, advocate uh, supporting local and we also uh, grow some of our ingredients. So that includes uh, calamansi and cacao in our farm in Leyte. Patisserie Le Chocolat started during the pandemic as an online business. When they gained traction, they set up a store in a mall in Manila and sold their premium pastries there. For this one, for our recipe, we're actually using the whole uh, calamansi fruit, so uh, nothing goes to waste. So to finish it off, I'm going to put this on top as our garnish and added calamansi flavor to our pastry. Filipino flavors are important in preserving our culture because it's actually our identity. It's how we introduce ourselves to the rest of the world. Across town, Chef Don Baldosano of Linamnam Manila has been testing the possibilities of Filipino cuisine. So Linamnam Manila is a restaurant here in the backyard of my home. So what we do is the possibilities of Filipino food. So basically, we try to learn from different cultures in different parts of the Philippines, try to get ingredients from there, and try to be as creative as possible with it. So whenever we make experiences for the restaurant, it always has to be something Filipino. Like, it's a tasting menu, but it's not patterned out of the usual French cuisine or Japanese tasting menus. It has to be purely Pinoy. That's why our tasting menus would include sabao, always have canin in the middle. So we wanted to start out with a dish na ala pobre, so playing out with soy sauce and calamansi. But when we've been we've been doing a lot of versions of this dish, but then we wanted to play out a new version wherein we're highlighting the fragrance of calamansi, from playing around with the leaves to like small buds of calamansi and like even infusing the peels in burro. So apparently we just wanted to give you a different side of calamansi naman, but still giving you that asim that you're looking for in the dish. So, parang, parang nakinlaw na siya essentially in the calamansi and the vinegar. We're gonna fish it out. Just leave it to rest for a bit. Para we can uh, cook it over extremely high heat later on before slicing it. Uh, the idea was like a sinoglaw dish where it was pork and fish. Then, yun nga, I thought na the best way to pair those was calamansi because you would kind of mask the agedness of the fish that we're using. Then, the pork naman you'd balance out the fat because we're mainly using a pork that's really fatty here. I think here in the Philippines, I think it's impossible for you not to find calamansi. I think it's a very important ingredient here in the Philippines. It, I think I, I would say it's a favorite fruit of us that we don't even know about. I mean, most of the things you eat would probably include calamansi. So while we're doing that, we could do the sauce as well na glaze niya. Then we season it with calamansi and a little bit of butter. I think one key difference is the tartness of the calamansi. It has this specific flavor that only calamansi would have. I mean, yuzu and lemon would have their different flavors uh, their, themselves than one. But when you try a calamansi or smell the calamansi, you know that only a calamansi would have that flavor. One of my dreams there would be na people would be actually proud of Filipino ingredients. We're not going to be looking for asparagus or mga fennel to work with like our dinners. We need to be proud of mga patola, squash, and calamansi. Besides its many culinary uses, calamansi also has a variety of cosmetic, pharmaceutical, and household uses. 
Yet according to data, the production of calamansi in the Philippines declined from 183,000 metric tons in 2011 down to 109,000 metric tons in 2020. If we value calamansi, why are we allowing this produce to shrink in terms of agricultural production? Is there a way to ensure that the value of calamansi is heightened and made into the next big thing? How can this be accomplished internationally? I briefly lived in Melbourne, Australia for a year and I couldn't help but notice unpicked calamansis from random houses around the city. Little did I know that for the Filipino diaspora, the tree holds a lot of significance. It is, it, says, it is, it is. My the Kappa. Kappa. Oh, so gosh, fun. okay. <gasps> oh my gosh. What do you think when you... It's like jackpot. Oh, oh my really god, that looks nice. so good. It's really pretty. It says kumquat, oh, but the scientific the name they've got at the back. Oh. Citrus microcarpa. If we get you, micro can you make it $40 each? Uh, kumka. Kumka. Yeah, in Filipino, in Philippines, we call it calamansi. Have you heard of it? Calamansi? Calamandin? Calamandin? I don't know if you know. Grace and Fidesz moved to Australia as young girls and co-founded The Entrepreneurs, a group of passionate Filipinos promoting Filipino food and culture in Australia. So, what do we got here? Long chilo. Calamansi. Oh, yeah. I wanted to put like um, patismansi. Patismansi. I must say, that's probably why I still gravitate towards coming to Footscray. Mm. Um, it was probably for my parents, if I reflect back on their own experience, it was almost still a gateway into their old life, but also yeah. a gateway to their new. Yes. Whereas for us, obviously we're a lot more assimilated to the Australian lifestyle, the Australian way of living. Mm. But for me, it's really important to bring my kids here because I want them to know how I grew up mm. and I want them to hear the different languages that make Footscray such a multicultural hub and for them to actually be curious to say, oh, what are they saying? Or what cuisine is that? What fruit is that? What vegetable is that? Mm. And for me to use food as almost like a gateway into conversations about heritage, mm -hmm. um, which I think is important, especially now, as my mum's no longer here, their Lola's not here, my dad's getting older. I just don't want them to lose sight of their part, part identity. Um, and I want them to be proud of it because for the longest time, I think we kind of didn't really shine bright with what it meant to be Filipino. Fides and Grace, who are both second generation Filipino migrants, saw how their parents clung to their roots by continuing to serve Filipino meals at home and even through something as simple as planting calamansi trees in their garden. Dad, the tree, how old is it and when did we plant it? When did you plant oh, it? Oh, this one, uh, since we uh, moved to this place, to this uh, in this Altona, mm. that's almost uh, maybe 30 years now or 40 years. Mm. I'm not too sure about it, but this tree, I bought it since we bought this land. Where did you find the tree, the actual oh, tree itself? The tree, I, I, I just found it in Laberton Market. The market. Uh, Vietnamese guy is selling all this, so... Oh, see, so there's a bit of a link there, because yeah. we just came out from Footscray, but... And then I planted here. Here we go. And why did you plant it? When you first saw it in the market, what did you feel? Oh, I, I was so excited because this is the tree yeah. that uh, the Filipino people always have in their backyard. So I, I realized then or oh, this might make our uh, good dishes and uh, things yeah. like that when they get bear fruits. Mm. So I bought it, even though it's so expensive. <laughs> because of this tree, I already gave lots of propagation to uh, my brothers, my friends. Mm. Now they are also growing their own calamansi at the backyard. backyard. Yeah. Like Fides, Grace also moved to Australia with her parents as a child. While she was only around a year old at that time, her parents, especially her mom, made sure to raise her and her sister in the Filipino culture by preparing Filipino meals at home using calamansi harvested from their backyard. 
Grace's mother, Cora, has since passed, but Grace keeps her close to her heart by sharing her mom's memories, traditions, and lessons to her own children. So Stella, what are we gonna pick? Calamansi. Now what's calamansi? Is it sweet or sour? Sour. Like what? Like, le like, like lemon. Like lemons. So these are like our Filipino lemons and lemon and limes. You wanna get the ones that are ready? Good job, here's some more. Wow, this one's a big one. You gotta show them how big it is. Wow, that's amazing. Good job with picking, Stella. Okay, so what do you guys got there? Calamansi. What's calamansi? It's, it's a Filipino, a it's kind of like a Filipino lemon. Yeah. Really? And do you, where do you get them from? Uh, from the tree. And then Lolo has some as well, right? Yeah. Can we do a bit of a taste test, see what it tastes like? What do you reckon, sweet or sour? I think it's very sour. Uh, let's try it out. Let's see who can keep a straight face without turning sour. Yeah. Let's see. Unlike Grace and Fides, who only have to go as far as their backyard to get calamansi, most Filipinos in the Philippines actually don't even know where their calamansi and other produce come from. Actually, ito po ay natutunan ko sa akin magulang dahil yung tatay ko, siya yung unang nagkalamansi dito sa amin. Tumatak na rin po sa isipan ko na yung palang pagkakalamansi ay isa rin pala siya maganda pong pagkakitaan. Sa ngayon, ang tanim ko ay isang libong kalamansi. At iba-iba ang edad nito, merong sampun taon, meron naman na limang taon, may edad naman siya na magdadalawang taon. Bali po sa iyong pong uh, kalamansi, pagka po siya nagbunga, depende po kasi yan sa taon. Halimbawa, pagka ang kalamansi ay nasa, na tinatawag po natin na kalakasan, nasa 2 to 4 years o pataas, ang kalamansi nagbubunga po siya ng uh, tatlong beses sa isang taon. Depende po yan doon sa pag-aalaga. Hindi po siya yung uh, gaya po ng mamanahon, ng gaya ng dalandan, ng suha, o uh, Ah, uh, yun po kasi yung kalamansi, ang kagandahan kasi niyan. Halimbawa, pero kang pinag-aaral ng yung anak, lalo na sa kolehiyo o kaya sa high school, aba, ah, basta pag nagka pag wala kang ng pera, wala kang panggastos, pipitas ka lang sa kalamansi. Kumbaga, ito yung tinatawag po namin na bangkong buhay. While kalamansi farming can be a profitable livelihood if done right, it isn't without its challenges. Farmers like Ver need to cope with the rising costs of fertilizer and pesticides, but there's a bigger hardship that they have to deal with before they can make a profit. In the Philippines, most calamansi farmers sell their produce to agents or middlemen who buy them in bulk. Sadly, some agents take advantage of the urgent need of farmers to move their produce. Ang ahente po kasi mayro po siyang patubo rin na isang daan sa isang bag. Ngayon, pagka halimbawa, ito po ay hindi po namin uh, ibinenta o ibinigay, ang mangyayari po sa aming pong uh, kalamansi, didilaw siya. Pag dumilaw siya, lalo magiging reject. Walang kikitain ang mga farmers. Kaya nangyayari na hawak po ng mga ahente, yung middleman kung tinatawag, yung presyo ng kalamansi kung magkano lang nila kukunin sa may-ari. Napakahirap mag-alaga ang taas ng abono. Pagkatapos, babaratin lang po ng middleman. Kaya nangyayari, mas malaki pa ang kinikita ng middleman doon sa nag-aalaga ng kalamansi na laway lang ang puhunan. There are, however, manufacturers who adhere to fair trade, like St. C, a medium-scale enterprise that produces all-natural Filipino condiments sold in the Philippines and countries such as Australia, New Zealand, the Middle East, the U.S., Japan, Korea, and some parts of Europe. So every production would sometimes uh, require about 500 kilos of calamansi to as much as 1,000 kilos of calamansi. Now we, uh, for now, we get our calamansi mostly from the middlemen, the traders. But we've actually started already talking to some farmers. It's not that difficult to actually find one right now. It's just that even the, the farmers themselves for now would rather deal with the dealers because they buy it in bulk and wholesale. 
So that's another hindrance that uh, for us to encourage uh, the farmers to actually deal with us rather than to the middlemen. We'd, we'd rather want it to be fair trade. Alan told us that what inspired him to start a calamansi processing business was a trip to Japan when he chanced upon the Japanese yuzu. Yuzu is actually a similar product as our calamansi. So the Japanese uses yuzu the, way, the same way we use our calamansi. For dipping, for sauce, for beverages, uh, and even for onsen baths, they, it's good to use it for, to refresh their skin. When I tried the fruit, and I happened to try also a bottle of yuzu, I couldn't quite tell the difference. Their fruit extract tasted like similarly as the one bottled. I was inspired by that, and I'm hoping to do something of similar level or quality for the Philippine calamansi. When we launched our product, we actually thought people would not mind it at all because it's so easy to purchase your calamansi fruit from the palenque or the supermarket versus that of our bottled calamansi. We were so wrong. When we launched our product, people actually loved the idea that you have a huge uh, bottle of calamansi that you can, of course, keep it in the refrigerator. And it would be okay for about from weeks to several months. Whereas you buy a fresh fruit of calamansi, the minute you buy that, count only about seven days and your calamansi will actually start rotting even inside your refrigerator. Calamansi definitely is one of the more important uh, condiments. I think it's about time the Filipinos realize the importance of coming out with good quality products. I think we should get away already from the mentality na pwede na ang pwede na yan. We've already been left behind, sadly. Uh, countries from uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, they all learn from us. That's the sad state right now of the country. And so if we keep churning out mediocre products, you know, we, we're not gonna get anywhere. So we, we need to focus on value adding because, uh, of course, we need to extend the shelf life of uh, the produced Kalamasi products. And, of course, the national government need to support the technology for food processing, not only with uh, the growing of the calamansi in general. But apart from its economic importance, one facet in the calamansi conversation that we can't overlook is its cultural value, how it speaks volumes of who we are as Filipinos and ties us all to the motherland, especially those like Grace and Fides, whose parents made the difficult decision to leave the country in search of a better future for their families. I think it finally felt like home when mum and papa probably planted all those trees in the backyard. So I like, just remember mum putting it in everything, like she used it in beefsteak, mm. in every time we had panset, it was always like something you squeezed on top. Yeah. And it was, even though we didn't have it and we would replace it with lemon, it just wasn't the same, don't you reckon? Mm. Mama's ulams and dishes would not be complete without the kalamanse, and this includes the palabok sauce that she taught me how to make and stuff, and that's mm -hmm. what we'll prep a bit later. Bella, your favorite. Yay! Dessert time! Nina Tamiz! <laughs> There's something that ties the Filipino Jasperus experience together. That courage to leave your country, juggle multiple jobs to save up enough money to build a home and give your kids everything they need, leaving family and friends behind, and of course that unshakable hope of better times that makes all this worth it. 
This poignant picture also describes what Fidesz's parents had to go through when they migrated to Australia in the 1980s. So mom, tell me more about, no actually you're the one who decided to come to Australia, for us to come to Australia. Is yes, that right? so we came straight to Australia. It's good that we have some friends who are already, already, already living here, yeah. Mm. And um, they're the one who help us. Yeah. And so when we, went, when, when we arrived in here, uh, year 1980. in 1982, we mm. arrived here. So yeah. I was? Yes, I'm August give my age 1982, away. and the girls that? and the girls are already like five, year, five and six years old. The flat what we live in is just in front of the school that they went to. That was in West Brunswick. We moved and here. And we, we don't have any idea what they're going to wear because we don't, we don't have any like warm clothes with us because it's all tropical climate in the Philippines. So we are all bringing summer clothes. Summer clothes. clothes. They had no and winter they, clothes. They have their pajamas when they go to school. We went to a park wearing their pajamas and everyone was laughing with us and I said, oh my goodness, I don't have any idea. And one of the ladies, a Filipino lady, is a member of the um, so, uh, Filipino community, a Filipino social worker. community, yes. So she gave us uh, mattresses, she gave us colorful chairs. And furniture, to set up furniture and you uh, imagine we're only eating on the floor with the like newspaper on the floor. Oh, I don't recall yeah. that. Wow. Uh, okay. Yes. And uh, after about two weeks, I was able to work. But oh, you found work within yeah, two weeks? Yeah, uh, within two weeks I found so work. Good. took him about three months and he you wants to go work. back home. <laughs> <laughs> but then when uh, we are both working and uh, we are settled, I'm working three different type of jobs. Wow. So you so, have your full-time job. Okay, yeah, I, I, have one full I have one full-time job and two part-time jobs. So there's, a, there's a bittersweetness to our migration is that when we leave, we leave what we love behind to start oh, a new yes. life. And for, plus uh, for our some of our cultures, traditions we brought with us. Yes. Like the calamansi. We have to, we have to plant calamansi because we are, it's really it's really to our helpful. Food. Calamansi, we can use it in every cooking that we want and mm. for sauces that we need. You've seen me and Ate grow up here. We have our Well, at children. this age, we're really happy. Yeah, we're now old that uh, we can see you living really well mm -hmm. with your children. So, um, and... You've done your job. You've done a very good job, <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's definitely room for Filipino food to become bigger in the global scene, and the best way for that to happen is for our flavors to be shared and experimented with overseas. This is what Melbourne-based chef Russ Magnaia and his team at Sarai tries to achieve, focusing on reimagined Filipino dishes and serving fun cocktails in wine. Yes, the dish is Skull Island King Prawns. Um, so basically, it's a really good Australian ingredient, the best prawns you get in Australia. Um, we serve it with a spiced burro butter, which is like butter smoked in a wood fire, straight the wood straight on it. Um, Bagoan, which is a Filipino shrimp paste, a burro and calamansi. All right, so like this one, sexy sauce, straight on it. So we put I put calamansi on the actual butter, but then we finish and we finish it with fresh calamansi as well. Then we squeeze the calamansi on top. Best part. Mm. Well, yeah, so I came, I can't really, I can't remember how, what age, but young. Yeah. Um, my mom's a nurse, migrated here with my father, and then my sister and I came after. Um, and then, yeah, we, I grew up in the northern suburbs. You know, when you're in the Philippines, there's always family around and stuff. Here was kind of like, just us. Which was kind of a blessing at the same time. Yeah. Um, but food's always been part of it. 
you know, I was Filipino, it's like uh, birthdays, weddings, um, and stuff like that, I think. It's really important. Uh, I started cooking when I was 18. So my grandma, Carol, used to have a restaurant overseas. And I think that was a big uh, part of it as well. Why I love food so much. It wasn't like, oh, I'll show you how to do that. No, it wasn't like that. It was about like respect to tradition and respect for like old school techniques and stuff. And then, if, for example, if she wanted coconut milk or cream, she'd get actual coconut and, you know, it's very old school. And I think uh, as years go by, you get confidence about your culture, you get confidence about your culture, and you kind of think like, wow, like the flavors that I eat, it's amazing. And how do you portray that, right? Well, I mean, at the restaurant, so the idea of the restaurant is kind of like, it's obviously not traditional Filipino food, but what we do is take a really good Australian ingredient and then pair it with like a sauce that's very Filipino, combine that, and then you cook everything on the fire, right? Because I think when I use calamansi, I kind of like do it in the end rather than incorporate it in the actual sauce so it doesn't go like super bitter. Yeah. You know, not too um, acidic. So we have lamb ribs uh, from Gippsland, local. It's kind of like an adobo style, but we put calamansi in it. So we cook it in a master stock, smoke it, and then finish it in a wood fire. Put a bit of the adobo sauce here. And finish it with some calamansi. Yeah, exactly. For the because for for the restaurant, like people don't know calamansi at all, you know. So when they come in here, Ralph does a cocktail with calamansi and bagong, for example. Straight away, it's conversation, conversation starter. If Ross is in charge of the kitchen at Sirai, Ralph is the man behind the bar. Through the drinks that he creates, Ralph gives people a glimpse into his heritage, experiences, and imagination, like this calamansi forward cocktail. The Baraka elixir, uh, the story behind that is actually the first time really experiencing calamansi. Uh, my first experience of it was when, uh, I think it was 2014, I was in, in Boracay, um, and I got stung by a jellyfish while diving. Um, and the locals, uh, the locals gave me calamansi as a way to, to you know, fast heal it or you know, soothe the pain. Um, and so, you know, these little green balls and, and they cut them up and they started rubbing it on my, my, my arm and um, yeah, and that's, what, that's where the term Barakai Elixir came from. It's when everyone claps. <laughs> there you go. Bit of banana leaf just to, and that's the uh, Barakai Elixir. In cocktails, you have a um, I guess like a guideline that's known as three, two, one. So you have three parts alcohol, two parts citrus, and then one part sugar base. Um, and calamansi falls in between that one and two for me. Um, does have a bit of sweetness to it, but also has that citrus backbone. So, um, so I do hold off on on using other other citrus when I when I add calamansi in it. Besides kitchens and bars, wouldn't it be great to see calamansi flavors in more retail-facing products? Mark and Jenny are the owners and makers of Darawit Valley Cider. In their heritage cider orchard in Lansfield, Victoria, they grow their own French and English style variety apples that they then process into their own cider. Can you please help explain from your chefing point of view the aromatics of calamansi. It's, how can I explain that to people? Um, it's a combination of orange and lemon, po possibly not strong orange, like I would say more mandarin. Um, mm. uh, it's, it's got a lovely sherbety kind of aromatic with an, just an initial very rough blend into a cider. It matched very well. So, mm. and that's the first test, whether it clashes immediately, because if it does, then you've got a lot of work to do. But I think from a very initial early blend, the match is lovely. 
I'm a Filipino Australian and we moved to Australia when we when I was two years old uh, with both my family and grew up in the western suburbs of Victoria and yeah I feel very lucky too because western suburbs is a melting pot of cultures so we really got to experience a whole heap of cultures, a whole heap of identities of, um, and food. I feel very lucky that our parents thought that there's something different and something possibly better for them out there. So I, yeah, I always admire that they made that leap at a time where travel was not as common. And I think that's just amazing. In the Western suburbs, in Altona Meadows, we had a tiny lawn of about 10 by 20 metres, um, but because of my partner making cider, he was a home brewer, he'd been a home brewer for about 10 years, um, we couldn't get cider apples, so we set out to plant our own. So very strange going into a space that you have no experience other than that you love a product and you want to be able to create it with the best ingredients that are available. So um, yeah, we went out here and planted the cider apples. So Mark, the cider maker, is a chef by trade. He's um, always been driven by flavor. So he's, and that shows through our cider as well. So. Um, DV Cider is available in about 160 stores and restaurants around Victoria and I'm happy to say also in Japan. They're loving the flavours, they understand the DV style and they just understand the DV artwork. And what do you think the biggest challenge will be with working with an acidic product with our ciders? Well, not to get into a sweet and sour kind of territory because, mm. I mean, it, it may need a little sweetening, but what we don't want is a can of Solo, which is a sweet mm. and sour drink. We don't, we're not looking for that. We're looking for something a little bit more professional and more cultured than that. Uh, this is a pear and apple blend, um, which, Pear has some natural sweetness in it, so uh, it has some unfermentable sugars, which leaves it a little bit sweeter. So really, it's just a matter of I just put a little bit in there like that and so blended this, it up. So this is a calamansi, pure calamansi extract from Philippines. Mm, it's very nice. I think we should bottle it right now. <laughs> I think there's certainly room for exploration with that. It certainly fits with our ethos of trying something different and importantly something that tastes amazing and um, working with that. So. Weighing in on the potential of calamansi is Pat Norse, creative director of the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival. Pat has been a restaurant critic, food and travel writer for over 20 years. When people ask me what's special about Melbourne, I think one of the things that really jumps out at me is the grassroots availability of ingredients. What I can't buy readily, at least not yet, is the calamansi. That's the power of deliciousness. The potential of calamansi, I think, is significant. Um, I mean, when you think about how transformative the flavor of some of those really distinctive citrus fruits can be, Calamansi could be the next big thing there. You think about yuzu, you think about macro lime, you think about ingredients like that. There's no substitute for those. They are the essence of those cuisines. I think Filipino food is just getting started in the restaurants of Australia. They've always been incredible Filipino people contributing to our great restaurant scene in this country. But are they well represented in the restaurant scene? Not as well as they could be, that's for sure. Uh, and it's not for want of talent, and it's not for want of a great cuisine. I think it's about familiarity. So the good news is those things can change really quickly. I think generationally, we're really, really ready for it. I think there's a lot of interest in the Philippines as a destination for travel. There's a lot of interest in the flavors of the Philippines for food and drink. And we've got great champions, particularly right here in Melbourne, who can really bust those doors down and really make the, the difference. When it comes to the potential of calamansi, we are barely scratching the surface. We have the produce, the flavors, and the champions that push this native produce forward. All that's needed is consistency, awareness, and some time. 
Of course, support from the government wouldn't hurt either. I think it's not just about the fur and how we use it. I think it's like a symbol of like, hey, this is Filipino, and this is like a specific ingredient that we use. Yeah. And I think for me that's important. And it's a whole different conversation just from Kalamansi, right? It's more of like we need to appreciate our own culture and our own food. Uh, a lot of us would look up to fine dining or just really good food. Nah, it has to be international food. But I think it's more about us thinking that our food is actually good. Now you can be put up next to French, Korean, American food per se. Pero we're still gonna be shining because I think we're not that proud yet of our food. That's why we're not yet there. But once we get that, we're gonna be there for sure. I think calamansi would help a lot. I mean, it, so I think it could help us. You know, get there na people would know that there are actually really good ingredients here in the Philippines. Which are, there are. The problem, the main concern right now is that we're not the only ones making calamansi. We have been making coconuts, uh, mangoes, pineapples, and things like that. You know, we're, we're starting to be left out again, you know, because some of the countries like Thailand and Vietnam or even Indonesia are producing it faster, good quality, and being able to distribute it uh, around the world. And sadly, no, the government, their government has the one been helping them, subsidizing them, pushing their products. We need to do the same for our calamansi. You know. Well, it starts with us, right? Like, it starts with us. If we don't see value in our identities, so how are we supposed to spruik that to others, right? And I would say, if you're really part of our childhood living in Australia, there was so much assimilation being done. Like, you'd go into your primary school, yeah, I'm Aussie. What? No, I'm Aussie. Like, I don't forget about the fact that I've got, like, Sydney gum in my... But that's funny in my lunch. Yeah, right. For lunch. Uh, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't like being brown. I didn't like being Asian. I didn't like being... I just wanted to be well, Australian. And really, it's only till maybe the last 10 years, I won't tell you my age, but the last 10 years, where you really sort of, um, and especially having children, it's really sort of helped me reframe uh, my identity and try to, I guess, learn more about head, why it is the issue. You continue to learn, but now with children, I also want them to have a connection to that. Because, you know, when you think about it, if we don't pass on, well, to my children, if I don't pass on anything about my shit again, then be, there'll be a whole bath and all be to see. It'll end there. Kalamansi is so much more than just an ingredient. It's about supporting our local farmers, producers, and SMEs to gamble on their heritage and their dreams. It's a battle for representation and the acceptance of Filipino cuisine and culture internationally. It's about finally giving a voice to a country that exports 10 million workers annually and the millions more who have migrated out, but who have yet to break out in the culinary scene or achieve that much-awaited breakthrough in their and their families' lives, all while staying true to what it means to being Filipino.